universe. Euh, le son en sortie. Ok, great. Euh, donc c'est le rainbow. Uh, sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, so today we are the favorite to uh, Jean Bonneau. Uh, Jean is a researcher at INSEL, currently working at the uh, Brain and Spine Institute in Paris, ICM. Uh, he's a co-leader of the uh, Motivation Brain and Behavior team. Uh, there are many PRs in that team actually, so Jean is the, the, the expert of uh, computational modeling. There is also um, uh, Mathias Pesseglion, who is the expert of uh, human cognitive neuroscience. Sébastien Bourré, uh, expert of monkey, macaque monkey cognitive neuroscience, um, doing electrophysiological recordings, and two medical doctors, uh, Raphael Lebou, who is a neurologist, and uh, Femme Ratier, who is a psychiatrist. So this illustrates the uh, rather uh, interdisciplinary approach of uh, this team. And uh, Jean can apply his skill at uh, modeling things to all those aspects. And today is going to uh, illustrate uh, this approach with a, a specific uh, example, which is as you can read in So thank you very much, Jean, for being there today. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, for those who are not just, make, just want to make sure the slides go up. Okay, fair enough. So, um, I'm going to talk about today um, a way to try to identify and be evidence biological constraints on the way uh, the brain processes information. That's not something easy to do if you think about it. So, and the main reason why it's not something easy to do is because we have no idea really how the brain should process information. Right? So whether it deviates or how it should process information, which would be the signature of biological constraints. That's not something easy to get at this. And to do this, um, I'm going to use computational modeling. Okay. So can you can you all hear me? Okay. Right. So and of course the interests for me and for people in the team is trying to, for example, capture some aspects of irrational behavior, right? So irrational behaviors, you could think of it as uh, errors the, the brain makes and very specific types of errors the brain makes. And, and the question that we try to ask is, are those errors eventually related to some form of biological constraints? And of course, that reasoning doesn't apply to all forms of irrational behaviors. There are explanations at the psychological level, but here we're trying to get at the neurological level. So 
Let me give you an example of what I mean here. Let me start with this example. So maybe you all know this. Uh, it's called the framing effects. It's an example of irrational context dependence. So this is a uh, behavioral uh, um, phenomenon. So the typical ex experiment, experiment goes like this. So you, you, you have participants who are asked to choose between two options. One is a sure option, where the outcome of the action is known. And one is a risky option. In a game frame, as a participant, you're told, okay, you receive 50 quids, and then you have to choose between keeping 20 quids or gamble, where you have a some probability of keeping all the money you received at, uh, at first or losing all. And the probability of uh, um, keeping all or losing all is given by this pie chart here. So that would be about, I don't know, like something like 40% keeping all in that situation here. And that would be the game frame, and that would be the similar uh, um, uh, decision problem expressed in the loss frame, where you're told you receive 50 quids, and then you're told to choose between losing 30 quids or gambling. So the objective information is exactly the same, right? Exactly the same, but people don't behave the same. So what you have, I don't know that pointer here, but on the bottom left here, is the probability of people uh, of gambling, right? So that's the average gambling probability at the group level. And what you see is that when they are uh, asked to uh, choose between a share option and the, and the risky option, when framed, when the, when the share option is framed as a game, then they tend to effectively keep the money, whereas they tend to gamble if the share option is framed as a loss. And and again, because the objective information is exactly the same, this is irrational in the sense that you should not change your risk preferences just as a function of how people frame the decision problem for you. And that experiment was done in the scanner. And um, in particular, that experiment was performed here uh, by Bento de Martino about 15 years ago. And what he found was that uh, the amygdala was actually, the, the profile of activity of the amygdala was reproducing behavior. So effectively, the amygdala neurons were shouting in the game frame when people were choosing the show option and shouting in the loss frame when people were choosing the, the risky option. So um, the logic here was to say, maybe the reason why we are more or less sensitive to risks is because we're afraid of losses. And the amygdala here, given its new involvement in fear, uh, was a natural uh, suspect for, for influencing behavior here. But when you think about this, this new imaging results does, that, does not explain the behavior. It's just reproducing it. In fact, you could say, if amygdala was just looking at what people were doing, this is exactly what we, it should be doing, right? So shouting when people are actually choosing the option they choose. So what I'm flashing here is what I'm highlighting is the fact that this is an interesting behavioral uh, phenomenon, but the uh, neuroimaging results is not an explanation for it. So if we want to understand why people are expressing or exhibiting such context dependent uh, um, effects, then we need something more than just showing that, for example, the amygdala is more or less active in some of the conditions of the tasks. And there is one, um, and I'm in the field in which I'm working, but in machine making, uh, this is the typical kind of explanation. So this is the neural basis of uh, the framing effects. Again, this is not an explanation in the sense that it's not explaining why people are doing this. However, um, there are other fields of research who have done, uh, I think, more profound uh, um, thinking about um, uh, some of the um, um, Behavioral, um, um, well, some of the uh, mysterious phenomenon that they actually can observe behaviorally speaking. So you probably all know this illusion, right? So this is a checkerboard, um, and uh, there are two uh, uh, zones in that checkerboard. One is enlightened, and one is effectively covered by shade, and that changes your perception of whether. Um, those boxes on the checkerboard are more or less uh, um, luminous, if you will. Right? And in particular, the A and B boxes, they don't look the same at all, 
right? So you think or you perceive A as being much more dark, much darker than B, right? And of course, that's the nature of this illusion. If you remove the context, of, um, if you remove it away, which I've done here, you can see that now A and B are exactly the same in terms of how much dark they are. And one explanation for this is branch adaptation of neurons in the visual system. So what branch adaptation says is that if neurons have to encode the information about how much light or how dark something is, it has to effectively, um, uh, what the, the relevant information here is the contrast between wherever you're looking at and its neighborhood. So the neurons have an only a limited range of physi physiological activity to signal uh, uh, this information. And therefore, if they just stay the same, then some, uh, some activity will actually saturate and it will not transmit that information. So somehow to solve that problem, neurons adapt such that they change the, the, the range of stimuli uh, around which they actually change their firing rates, which is expressed in that graph on the right here. So depending on how much, on where you stand in terms of variations of light, the visual neurons here in the retina actually change uh, how responsive they are, right? So they actually make it so, so to say, that they fire, they, they, they they occupy the range of uh, light stimuli, if you will, that maximizes the viability of the firing rates, so that the information is maximally transmitted to the rest of the brain. And that's called branch adaptation. And that's, that was evidence in the visual system for decades now. And there was one uh, um, uh, visual uh, neuroscientist who uh, really thought about what that means. And he, he interpreted this range adaptation phenomenon in terms of what he called efficient coding. The idea is very simple. So if you had to, if you, if effectively um, this A and B here phases corresponds to, uh, to light density between here and here, um, and then this is, uh, uh, I, I can't remember the name of that color in English, but like this, this, this neuron here has to include this kind of range and it doesn't that, then of course, um, uh, the firing rate will be almost the same because there's neural noise on top of that, really you wouldn't see anything. So it's more efficient to actually adapt the range uh, uh, of neural firing to the range of uh, uh, variations in the stimulation of those neurons. And that's the notion behind efficient coding, right? So the somehow neurons are equipped with uh, physiological mechanisms that accounts for the biological constraints that they actually have to work with, which is the limited firing range they actually can uh, um, play with, so to say. And they just shift along their um, threshold for firing such that they maximize the, 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 possible, the possibility for variations or informations um, down the stream. So that's the notion behind efficient form. And that was taken by, uh, this idea was taken by uh, people working uh, on uh, decision making, in particular decision making based on values, uh, decision making based on preferences, right? So uh, values are just, you know, where you like or you want stuff. And there are a couple of experimental studies that actually um, provide evidence for maybe the fact that the brain systems that encode values actually also expresses something like range adaptation or efficient coding. So I'm showing you here uh, that one of these examples. So in that example, um, that's a study by um, Kobayashi um, about 12 years ago. You know, so so uh, those monkeys, um, I hope people can still hear me. Those monkeys here, they have to choose between two stimuli. And those stimuli are abstract fractals here, but they, the, the monkeys have learned that these and these stimuli have been associated with some amounts of reward, in particular juice, like fruit juice that they want to run. And in one context, what they call the narrow context here, the type of, of uh, reward that they have to choose between is within an hour range. So it's like two drops of juice against three drops. 
three drops of juice, for example. And in another context, which they call the wide range, those rewards will actually scale on the wider range. So it's like one drop of, ju of juice against five drops of juice. Okay, so you could say one difference is one difference is a difficult to consider, but in particular, here what is interesting is just the fact that the value of of those actions which they really scale almost linearly with the amount of juice that um, um, would actually receive by choosing any one of these two drops. But when you look at the fine rates of those neurons in the orbital temporal complex that are known to input value, this is what you find. So um, this is the graph on the um, middle top row here. So on the x axis, you have the juice volume that they would actually receive. And you have the fine rate of the OFC neurons for the narrow context in a dashed flat line, and the white context, the red dashed, the sort of red plane line. And what this graph is showing you is that the way those neurons encode value or the relationship between value and activity of those neurons actually changes depending on whether the context is wide or narrow. So according up, um, uh, to whether those neurons have to encode a contrast between a very low and a very high reward or some somehow two medium rewards with a very small difference of value. So that's that's the whole map of range adaptation, right? So the, the, those neurons adapt to the range of differences of rewards that they have to cope of contrast of rewards that they have to cope, right? So um, and that experiment has been produced a number of times already, in particular by also by people from the group And that's the typical um, um, uh, results that somehow is another way of looking at the same thing. So, so um, this is again like what they call offer value, which is just the value of a particular option that that um, monkey have to choose uh, from, um, and um, in different um, context, where well, the context here is given by the difference in value between that option and the other option that was proposed to the monkey, uh, you can actually draw different graphs which represents the fine rates of those OFC nodes, the same OFC nodes that input value, as a function of whether the value of the option that they encode now is more or less similar to the value that they have to choose between. What you find is the same thing, namely that when they have to input a very high uh, uh, difference in value, effectively, the value that you encode is coded in a, with a lower, if you want, um, um, linear um, um, correlation coefficient, as opposed to when the actual range of values that they have to encode is small in that sense. Here now, the, the, the change in neural time rate that is evoked by changes in value is very high. So, Again, this is just the same phenomenon. You just look at a different from a different angle, right? So the idea is that depending on whether you have to call that kind of range of value or that kind of range of value, the proportionality between value and time range will change in those who have seen your own selection platform. So they adapt to the range such that eventually the minimal and the maximal value corresponds to the minimal and the maximum time rate. Okay, so that's the variability of the neural firing rate is maximized for a given uh, range of value that they have to encode. And I think this is a, this is a, um, and of course that was interpreted again in terms of efficient coding and in terms of um, all the variants of that same idea. And I think this is a very seducing idea. Um, and it is, it is seducing idea because again, if you think about it, it's really saying something like, Neurons have biological constraints. They can only fire between, you know, uh, effectively zero and some maximal amount of firing rate. But they have to somehow deal with that constraint. And well, efficient coding would be the best attempt uh, 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 for the brain uh, for dealing um, uh, with that constraint and still transmitting information that is uh, necessary to produce here in particular. Uh, value-based decisions or rational behavior. So, um, right, but is it the whole story? So, um, so that was very trendy. Uh, for, for the past decades, there were lots of studies about this, um, showing aspects of range adaptation with the same idea of efficient coding. Um, effectively, again, like some mysterious way 
new ones in the OFC would have to deal with their own biological constraints. And um, the problem with that, or one problem with that, is that in most of these experiments, which were done in uh, monkeys with electrophysiology, the behavioral uh, consequences of that range adaptation uh, that you could see uh, uh, in OFC neurons were not observed. So as soon as you have something like this, you have the possibility for inducing behavioral biases, right? Because if you just change the range of rewards those neurons uh, uh, are exposed to, and you change their outputs, and then you change the value that is emitted, and then therefore you change the decision. But monkeys did not change their behavior as a function of the range of value that they were exposed to. So people were trying to think, hmm, maybe there's something bizarre uh, with that idea, or maybe it's not the whole story. And, and in fact, I mean, so there was no uh, no physical mechanism that was proposed to actually operate range adaptation, right? So, so how would that work? So, uh, do we have any clue about how would neurons, for example, adaptively, you know, change the firing threshold? such that the range is adapted to the range of stimulus that they are exposed to. Um, well, people didn't have a really good idea about this. And in fact, um, maybe there are other ways of looking at this. Um, so for example, uh, synaptic plasticity. So, um, okay, I take this example here, maybe to the different colors here. Uh, this is just a reminder for all of us that the brain is extraordinarily plastic. I'm not saying anything, uh, um, that you don't know already here, but that's a study by Luc Dufault, uh, where you broke his area in hundreds of patients, and those patients lost language, and then after six months, they recovered language. So the brain has just rewired. And well, we're accustomed to this idea, but you know, how does it work? Well, we, have, we have a lot of electrophysiological studies showing us you know, what synaptic plasticity is, how it works, in particular, what are its properties? Um, and um, there are specific aspects of synaptic plasticity that have intriguing properties. So hagen plasticity, which you probably have all heard about, is just one specific line of that. But it has the ability to produce, to rewire the, the brain in a, in a functional, meaningful way, because it just retraces roots or selects uh, um, um, information pathways that are um, relevant for any kind of information Processing. So, so this is the reason why later I'm going to focus on this. And, and then, of course, there is this um, anecdotal um, um, limitation in all these studies, and that essentially because they are coming from the monkey electrophysiology kind of like um, world. Um, you can't you can't just ask monkeys to to make decisions like this. You have to give them reward, and therefore um, you have to make and, and you have to make those decisions simple enough so that they actually can solve the problem. And those experiments were done in such a way that it's always the case that there is always a very simple stimulus that is skewing the reward in the end. So um, so it's like I give you this fractal here, and you're a monkey, and that fractal, you know, it tells tells you. I'm going to get two drops of juice, or I'm going to get three drops, three drops of juice, and the pleasure I'm going to get from that is just, you know, in proportion to the amount of juice I'm going to get. But it's never the case that those experiments were made in such a way that uh, those monkeys have to integrate different sort of cues. And if you think about this, this makes the situation, the situation very different. So, so the intuition that people gathered from those visual neural science, they are really uh, simple in, in, in kind, right? So it's like in the visual system, light enters the retina or the retinal uh, neurons, and then some more information about light gets out. Here, this is the same intuition. It's like a value Q enters those OFC neurons, and then, and then value information gets out of it. But reality is slightly different, right? So it's like usually to have to um, to, to make decisions, we have to construct value out of something that is different from value itself. So, for example, in the, in the example I gave you before, people have to integrate gains and losses, and those gains and losses, when integrated together, produce value, where value is now 
whatever you, how much you want some option which is made of a number of things in particular prospects of gains and losses. So what will happen to this logic of efficient coding when really what enters those OFC neurons would be Q's about values that are not value? Well, it's a question in itself. Um, we don't really know uh, how to think about this, or at least uh, the main thing about this. So and I'm going to argue effectively that there are at least two ways of thinking about this. So if you think of OFC neurons as being those neurons that take those value cues and mix them together to produce value, then to produce range adaptation, you, you at least can think of two different scenarios. One would be, you know, that would be the picture, right? So you have some information about, about gains, some information about loss, and there are some all sent or funneled to those OFC neurons that average or mix them together and to produce value. And then, of course, because again, the problem is still the same, if you have to compare values with a, with a narrow range or with a bright range, you still need to adapt from the perspective of not losing the information about value. Then you can do it in at least two ways. You can either change the properties of those neurons, for example, you change uh, uh, the fine threshold or the slope of that uh, uh, relationship between the stimulus, what enters and what gets out of the neurons, or you change you change the weights that somehow are responsible for how those neurons merge this, these two information to produce value, right? So one is about changing the physiological properties of the neurons. The other one is about changing the actual pattern of connectivity from those neurons upstream that convey information about the cues that are integrated to, to produce value, and the neurons actually are merging those cues to produce value in the UFC in particular. Right, so, okay. Is there any of these scenarios that, it's, that has some truth to it? Why is it interesting, by the way? So it's interesting because if we have some clue about how range adaptation operates, then we can probably predict, you know, how it will change the head. And that's interesting in itself. So here we, oh, I should say that the, that the work I'm presenting here is the work of Jules Brochard, who is uh, a PhD student under my supervision. He's now working in Germany. Um, but okay, so we took two data sets that are open data sets. Um, uh, from the Open Neural, uh, maybe you know that thing. Uh, it's a repository for fMRI um, and behavior. And, and those data sets, those two uh, data sets, actually reproduce an experiment that was um, quite well published by uh, the group of Fulbright a long time ago now. It's a very simple experiment about risk attitudes. So. Uh, it's a very similar experiment to the one I've shown you at the beginning of this talk. So uh, effectively, people are asked, for example, whether or not they want to gamble. So it's a yes or no decision. And the gamble is made of a 50% uh, chance of losing some money and a 50% chance of winning some money. And the only, experiment, the only thing that the experimenters are manipulating here is the amount of prospective loss and prospective gains that compose a gamble. OK, so when you think about this, so OK. You have a, and it's like you're tossing a coin, right? So 50% chance of losing or winning. But sometimes there's lots to win and a few to lose. And sometimes it's the reverse. And sometimes you both have lots to lose and to, and to win. So what do you do? Well, it depends on who you are and your history of, of experience with risks. But um, uh, the typical results here is that um, uh, there are two places in the brain that responds to this manipulation. Effectively, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the BNPFC, can be between the eyes here, and the ventral striatum. And those two places in the brain, those two systems, effectively shout more when value is higher, when, when the gamble value is higher, where the value of the gamble effectively increases when there's more to gain and decreases when there's more to lose. Right? And, okay, those two data sets, are doing this. We have the behavior, we have the fMRI, and the only difference between those two data sets is the range of the gains that people are exposed to. So in one group of people, which I call the wide range group, 
effectively the gains, the prospective gains for the gambles go from 10 to 40 and losses from 5 to 20. We are in now many groups. The gains go from, go from 5 to 20 and the losses go from, go from 5 to 20. So everything is the same. The only difference is that for one group of people, they are exposed to gambles that have higher gains. All right. What's the behavior of the people? So when we um, um, so we can extract, for example, the probability of gambling as a function of the gamble objective value. So the gamble objective value is just fifty percent times the prospective gains plus fifty percent times the prospective loss. Okay. And when we do this, um, uh, you find this kind of fact. Um, is that a question? So, um, so here, what you see here is that on average, you know, we probably want to map on average. Okay, so blue is um, the wide range group, right? Those people who are exposed to gambles that are on average more advantageous than the narrow range group in right? So, what you see here is really that the behavior of those, of those people is entirely different, right? So, so in particular, in the range that is common to both groups, in the, in, in the range of gamble value that is common to both groups, those people don't behave the same at all. And that can only be due to the context, where the context is whether or not they, on average, experience gambles with high value or with low value. But for those gambles here, they are the same value in both groups, and people don't react the same at all to them. Okay, in particular, people. From the narrow range, those guys who are exposed to on average gambles that are less advantageous than the blue guys, they gamble more. Okay, significantly more, of course. So that's the hallmark of range adaptation. Now, we looked a bit more into this. So we did something very simple. We first we, we first wanted to establish the behavioral effect. So so um, we did a very simple logistic regression. So we for each participant and each trial, we addressed whether or not people gambled according to the amounts of prospective gains and the amount of prospective loss, right? And then we have a weight for gains and weight for losses. And then we do this and we look at effectively whether the weights of gains and losses are different in those two groups. And what we find is that we expect the, the, the weights for gains to be different in those people because. Well, effectively, I mean, we buy the range of gains, and that's effectively the case. So the weight of gains is effectively higher for people in the narrow range group than for people in the um, wide range group. But that's also the case for the weight of losses. That's more interesting because that means that there's a spin order effect. So in addition to people becoming effectively less sensitive to gains in the, in the wide range group, we also have them make less sensitive to losses as well. And of course, that introduces that um, uh, the behavioral effect of And then we wanted to say, well, I mean, but is that all happening, you know, right from the start or is it developing over time? And so we did exactly the same, but now that logistic regression, we applied it to chunks of 16 trials, right? And we could look at um, effectively an index of how asymmetrical are gains and loss sensitivity, right? So we look at the ratio of the weight of gains and losses, because that ratio tells us where or not people become more sensitive to gains and, you know, when compared to losses, for example. Um, and that loss ratio is effectively the same in both groups at the beginning of the experiment, but then effectively those people, you know, spread apart as time unfolds. So as they experience more different types of gambles, their behavior becomes more different. So that effect that we see in the end, that we see that we can summarize like this, really unfolds over time. It's a, it's a form of range adaptation that is temporal in essence. It's a progressive change of the behavior of the people. Right. So the last thing we checked is, well, um, okay, so, If those uh, effects, those behavioral effects are due to some form of efficient coding, then one way of working or thinking about this is as follows. There are in somehow, somewhere in the brain, 
neurons that are sensitive to gains and neurons that are sensitive to, sensitive to losses. And those neurons effectively you know, transmit this information such that in the end, this information is uh, uh, conveyed to decision systems and people actually express a different behavior in those two contexts. And if this is really about efficient coding, then those populations of neurons that, for example, encode gains um, um, should be um, encoding gains differently um, in the wide range group and in the narrow range group, right? That's the um, results that people have um, demonstrated using monkey electrophysiology. So we expect them to be in the OFC, but there could be uh, different places in the brain where this is. So we looked in the brain using simple uh, universe ephemeral analysis at um, uh, whether or not there is a brain region that is such that it encodes gains or in fact losses in both groups of people, but it also has a um, rates of encoding. So uh, a, if you will, a proportionality uh, uh, between value and amount of response, bold response here, that is different in those two groups. And we found no place in the brains where that happens. So the fMRI results I'm showing you here, this is the summary of uh, brain areas where there are significant difference in the, in the uh, um, relationship between either gains or loss and bold activity. But those normal in brain regions actually encode either gain or loss in both groups of subjects. So there is no conjunction of those two effects. So there is no trace, at least in that, with that very simple kind of analysis, no trace of efficient coding. So, okay. And of course, um, many is, again, we should think differently about this, right? So, so, um, so there's this, this, this negative evidence. So we, we don't find uh, places in the brain where there's both an encoding of either games or loss or value, actually. We tried that as well. And a difference of this encoding in those, in those two groups, that's negative evidence. But also we have a positive evidence against efficient coding. So this spillover effect, the fact that we only vary the, gain, the, the range of gains, we actually do find that people change their sensitivity to losses as well. So that is not very well explained by efficient coding on those neural populations that are, that are coding gains or losses. So we're left with the, the possibility that maybe this is about integrating gains and losses, maybe in the OFC, maybe elsewhere. And then we need to find a mechanism by which um, um, the context, so the, the range of gains and or losses actually affects um, um, that kind of encoding to produce this behavioral effect. Okay, so of course here, this is not an easy thing to do. So, um, so there's no qualitative prediction that what could derive about how a um, neural population whose job it is to integrate gains and losses, uh, you know, how that neural population should respond to changes in ranges in gains, for example, and how it should then, you know, change its own activity such that in the end it produces the behavioral effect we see. So we resorted to uh, artificial neural network models to do that. So we have a very simple um, ANN, artificial neural network, that has two hidden layers. One layer is effectively Q specific, so um, it's composed of two sub layers. One first sub layer is just responsive to prospective losses, the other sub layer is responsive to uh, prospective gains. And all those neurons send the outputs to an integration layer, which is doing its job. And that layer then actually produces the behavior. So, so there is a population code about value, if you will, on the integration layers that produces whether or not people are gambling, depending on the, the, the gain or the losses that there are on that part of the trial. So, we can fit that model to the behavior of those people. So we fit all the uh, connectivity coefficients in that model to reproduce what people are doing. And then what we do is that we add two things. One thing is, well, effectively a, a mathematical uh, um, model of what efficient coding would look like in those integration neurons here. So this is what I call efficient integration. Um, 
So that's just, again, a rule by which progressively those neurons change their response properties such that they are maximally varying to their own inputs. Right? So each one of these neurons receives inputs that are a weighted combination of all the neurons in the uh, first layer. But of course, sometimes those inputs would be in the uh, um, saturating range of the integration neurons. So this efficient integration rule, what it does is that it changes the response of each of these neurons, of this integration neuron, such that that happens you know, as less frequently as possible. Okay, so that's efficient integration. So that's just, again, letting those integration neurons transmit as much information as possible for producing behavior. And then we have another um, um, mechanism here. Um, we, so we put it in a different model. Well, this is just heavy plasticity. So, so effectively, we just change the collection weight between any Q neuron and any integration neuron in proportion to the recent history of co-activity of those two neurons. So, so when, when effectively the covariance of output firing rates of Q neurons and integration neurons is increasing, the connection strength between those two neurons increases. So it's fire together, wire together. Nothing more like than, than this. Typical hybrid learning model. And again, so here for those two models, we have a model without any um, change in the wave response. And we have two ways of changing the response, okay, or potentially producing a neural adaptation effect. We'll see that this produces a neural adaptation. Um, and the only, in fact, it looks maybe complicated, but, but in fact, there's only one more parameter to add to, to produce this mechanism. So one parameter that controls the rate at which even efficient integration or even plasticity works. That's all. And okay, I'm not going to go into that. So this is, okay, okay we have to consider um, uh, a, an additional um, um, variant for those two models that is not a particularly interesting one, but we need to consider it because it changes the, the, the way those models uh, uh, operate. And what we have to consider on top of those two mechanisms is the fact that, so, each neuron in those ANN, you know, they, they, they do something very simple, right? So they, they just transform the input into some outputs with a very simple activation function, okay? And we took two different sort of activation functions. One is sigmoidal, and the other one is a bell-shaped, like a pseudo-Gaussian, if you want. So in both cases, you have a limited climb range, but in one case, it's monotonic, and the other, it's not. Okay, so we have on top book here, the behavioral cryptocurrency of those six NN models. Top row is, sorry, is, uh, if I'm correct, the, the, those pseudo Gaussian activation functions for the units. Bottom row, bottom row is um, the sigmoid activation function. Here you have uh, ANNs uh, without neither efficient integration nor any density. Here you have um, efficient integration, and here you have high density. And that's just uh, uh, looking at the prediction error rate. So when you fit those models, you sometimes they call to explain the behavior. So that's how much error they make as a function of the gamma expected time. And what you see here is that they are pretty much all the same. Well, if you really uh, want to see something, you'd say that maybe this guy and this guy over there, they win something compared to the other ones, you know, when the vision becomes difficult. So when the decision value becomes closer to zero. But we can't say much about this beyond, um, um, beyond that. So we resort to another way of looking at or uh, comparing those models. So, but before that, we wanted to check something very simple. We wanted to check whether those ANNs, you know, they, all, they, all, they already reproduce something that we know about the electrophysiology of those value neurons in the UFC in particular. And we know a lot of stuff about them. So for example, we know that there is a diversity of coding of value in those OFC neurons. So by the way, Schopa and colleagues, what they, what they typically do is that they, they record those OFC neurons that are in code values, supposedly, uh, when monkeys make decisions, and then they try to categorize them according to the kind of response those neurons exhibit. And they have found that they have three classes, at least three classes of neurons in them. Those neurons that respond to choices, so uh, those are neurons that are, have a different level of activity when the monkey chooses in here the, the gamble or not. 
they are neurons that encode chosen value. So those are neurons who act, whose activity increases with the value of the chosen option. Okay, so when monkeys choose to gamble, then there's going to be a value to the gamble, and those neurons will actually scale up with uh, their activity will scale up with the value of the gamble. But when monkeys actually do choose to not gamble, I mean they, those neurons will actually encode the value of not gambling, which is zero, uh, no perspective loss, no um, uh, gains, or at least it's constant. And now neurons will put also value. So here that would be the value of the gamble, whether irrespective of whether or not the, the monkeys actually choose to gamble or not. And we know in, that, in this, those kind of experiments that we should find neurons in the OFC that actually are um, either uh, responsive to choice or to chosen value or to offer value. So we did the exact same kind of analysis that those um, uh, entrophysiologists did on these OFC, those real OFC neurons, on our artificial units, just to see whether we could find the same sort of results. And we did find the same sort of results. So this is the proportion of artificial units that include either offer value, chosen value, or choice. And that is reminiscent of what people find in the OFC neurons. So we know we, with those models, we have some diversity of coding that actually is very similar to what we find in the OFC. Okay. But, okay, can we say anything about whether any of these models is telling us something about why people change their behavior? So we did two things. The first thing is that we did out of sample behavioral predictions. So, Okay, we have fitted our animals to, to each subject, you know, on a trial by trial basis, estimating all the parameters and getting uh, some prediction, I would call it post-diction of, of the behavior we are trying to fix. But now we take those uh, fit um, uh, AN parameters and then we simulate uh, for each subject what that subject would have done if it had been exposed to the series of uh, prospective gains and losses of all of the subjects of the other group. Okay, and then we look at whether, effectively, um, uh, when that subject, if it was a subject for the other group, whether it would have done something similar to the other group. And we do this for all the subjects, and then we bin all our predictions according to gamble value, and we look at uh, what we what we what we have. And this is what we find. So let me um, explain how a graph is constructed here. So, so on the x-axis, this is the expected value. The gray zone is the common range of values for those two groups. Okay, so this is the interesting uh, zone. This is the, the zone where any difference is only explained by the context, if you will. Otherwise, you know, beyond this is explainable by the differences in value by itself. The uh, dots with the uh, error bars. Are, the, are people's uh, real behavior in particular. So for example, those blue dots here, uh, this is the gambling probability of people from the wide range group observed gambling probability on average. The plain blue line is the fit of the ANN models for that group. So this is um, ANN models fitted to two people from the wide range group. And this is how much that from fit explains the behavior we're trying to fit. And the dotted line is the um, um, uh, prediction about people from the wide range group taken from the group of people, the models fitted on the group of people from the narrow range group. Okay, if that model prediction was perfect, it should be aligned with the plain line. Okay. So if you look at all these graphs, the only thing that matters really is whether those dotted lines in the common range of value have the correct ordering of the gambling probabilities, right? So if you can predict out of sample that if you expose a system with a range of value, it would actually gamble more or less, as we see, depending on that range, then you're fine. And the only model that actually does this is the one above here on, on the top right. That's the model with the um, bell shaped activation functions and with hydrogen plasticity in place. So that model predicts out of sample what people exposed with an entirely different gains, sorry, range of gains would actually uh, behave uh, in, a, in that context. That's the only model that is able to um, predict correctly 
the um, um, range adaptation effects due to the manipulation of the range of case. All the other ones actually get wrong. So they have actually produced uh, uh, predictions that don't change pretty much uh, the behavior of the people uh, according to the range. So they, so you feed them, they explain correctly the behavior of the, that they're trying to explain. And then when you ask them you know, what the other girls would have done, they tell you they would have done the same as the one I've just trying to explain. The only one that is actually correctly capturing this is the um, uh, and then with a uh, hidden intensity in there. We can end with we thought, okay, but can we find any you know, evidence in the brain for this? So here we resort to representational similarity analysis. So for those of you who don't know, this is how we uh, do things. So for each participant and each trial, we have a fitted uh, 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 AM model fitted on the behavior. And then we actually have because at that particular trial, there was a prospect gain and a loss, and a, and a specific history of experience of gains and losses before, that model produces some pattern of activity in its integration layer. We take that pattern of activity for each trial, and then we look at what is called the RDM, so a, a representational dissimilarity or similarity matrix, and it's just looking at whether this pattern of activity is is similar on trial I and on trial J. Okay, so we get a N by N matrix where N is the number of trials. And then that matrix tells us whether the representation or the pattern of activity in the integration layer is similar in any pair of trials across pairs of trials. And of course, we can do the same with the fMRI. Okay, so we, we take regions of interest. Uh, um, and then we uh, uh, take patterns of activity that we measure here, we form RDMs, and then we look at whether those fMRI derived RDMs are similar to those ANN derived RDMs. And if that's the case, then we got effectively evidence that our model is telling us something interesting. Okay. And of course, you have to understand here that, okay, why do we use that? Because we don't want to have to fit, you know, one parameter per units in the in our fMRI signals in particular um, uh, and on top of that we we just want to have information about patterns of activity not about their particular or specific changes across subjects so that is well very well to do, to do that and of course I, I remind you here that we don't fit any model uh, uh, at this stage right so the model was fit to the behavior it produces some uh, neural pattern of activity we just look in the, in the fMRI whether it looks like what we measure. Actually, what those guys who put those fMRI data sets on the upper neural actually measured. Okay. Um, and we looked in particular in the OSC. So we considered three sub regions of the OSC. So left and right BA13, so Bromo area 13, um, typically investigated by those electrophysiologists when they, when they look at uh, value, and the VMPFC. Uh, and so, so here, what we want to see is so the, the evidence for uh, if integration slash shed intensity mechanisms would be uh, um, uh, the signature of that of those mechanisms would be such that we're not looking for difference between groups here, because the um, the, the models already capture a difference between groups. So we want to see effectively uh, a significant. Um, resemblance between those fMRI and ANN derived LDNs in both groups of, sub of subjects, right? So we did this for um, our three best models, so we have a heavy intensity with Gaussian uh, uh, or bell-shaped activation functions. This is efficient integration uh, with sigma wave stuff, and this is our control, which is the uh, AN models without any ability to produce range adaptation. And that, what we find, and of course, uh, shaded here are non significant results. Um, um, uh, Saving colored uh, stuff are significant. So it didn't work that well in the VMPSC, but in left and right BA13, it actually worked very well. And of course, we have both a significant relationship between uh, fMRI activity in the models in those regions and a greater, significantly greater uh, um, uh, resemblance. Um, between the two RDMs for this model when compared to the other models. So we have evidence that 
uh, well, I take this as evidence that um, this hybrid plasticity uh, uh, mechanism, when put into some agnostic AN model that just is trying to construct value out of the prospective gains and losses, is able to both out of sample predict what people would do in a different game context and uh, predicts how the uh, multivariate patterns of activity in the fMRI in the OFC is looking like. And of course, we could check other things for this model, but uh, like this, I'll just send to check. So we looked at um, so each subject has a loss aversion index. That's the ratio between the sensitivity to gains and losses. And we looked at whether uh, you know uh, the model was actually properly predicting uh, uh, this across subjects. People are different, have different loss aversions depending on who they are and what experience they have in the past. That's the case. We looked at whether this model actually was able to predict you know, the, the temporal separation of this loss aversion index across time. Um, that's the case as well. And then we uh, effectively reproduced the, the um, analysis that um, um, electrophysiologists did with ERC neurons um, uh, when they were um, um, extracting evidence for random adaptation. So, so we looked at typically um, if we um, partition our trials according to chunks of 16 trials, each chunk has a given range of gains and losses. So now we could look at whether the um, um, the relationship between value range, sorry, between value within those uh, chunks of trials and activity in those new in those units actually decreases as a function of the range of value for that particular chunks. This is what you have here. This is a typical analysis that they do. I'm not sure I was uh, clear enough here, but I can answer questions if you want. But that, that effectively works both with range and with expected value, um, for example. So we, we effectively have reproduced with those models the main um, uh, properties of value coding in OFC neurons that are known in the, um, uh, from electrophysiology in monkeys. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. I've already eaten a lot of your time. Um, so uh, just three points for discussions of conclusions. Um, um, I think I think what I've shown here, really, if if we if we take perspective, is that range adaptation could mechanically follow from just assuming that range adaptation in the OFC, OFC neurons transform option attributes into option values. So we depart from the perceptual logic where value enters and gets out of OFC neurons. It's more like different cues that are needs to be integrated are integrated in OFC neurons, and of those OFC neurons construct value out of these cues. So we need that assumption, and we on, on top of that to say something like connections between attribute specific and integration specific neurons undergo an intensity. And that is sufficient by itself to produce range adaptation. That's what is interesting here. So, so this identity rule is not meant to produce range adaptation, it just does it. So to say, okay, and we can discuss what are the conditions for uh, uh, this uh, constraint or mechanism to produce when I when you have but uh, it, uh, that's interesting to keep in mind. So, uh, and I think I think this is just one example of using artificial neural networks to try to evidence some form of biological constraints that may shape or distort the way the brain processes information. And of course, I should add that whether this kind of mechanism generalizes to more instantaneous range adaptation effects, like the framing effects, or is that, that's, that's a difficult question. And, and that's not the point of, of today's um, talk. So I thank you very much for your attention. Um, that's it.